good. All right. It's, it's your show, Joe, you can go ahead. Okay, I'm gonna click continue and okay. Uh, well, welcome everybody. I think we have one new user to uh, the, uh, the session on hearing aids for beginners. This is part one of three and the other two will be Monday and Thursday of next week. Um, so you can see my name and information. And the uh, next slide is, in the case, this is a program of the uh, Rochester chapter of the Hearing Loss Association of America. And uh, that is our, our address there. And about the chapter, this is one of uh, several programs of this chapter for people uh, with hearing loss. Other programs and features include a high quality and well-maintained website, which includes membership information, a monthly education and informational session on various topics of interest for people with hearing loss on the first Tuesday of each month. Um, uh, and occasionally we have one that consists of, of messages for, or a, a chance to speak with a particular audiologist of the, of, of the area and ask, ask questions uh, about various items. And this is a very popular item here. And then on the first Tuesday or second Tuesday of each month, we have our hope sessions, which I run. And this is a chance for people with hearing loss to get together and share their experiences with their hearing loss and their hearing aids and learn from others what is um, normal and what one can expect in an informal group discussion format. We have a demonstration center of various assistive devices on the third Thursday of the month. And here, Charlie's a, a primary uh, a person involved and Lauren and Eric and Dan Brooks. This is for people with advanced hearing loss who need more than hearing aids. Right now it operates virtually. Um, we have an annual featured, featured speaker program presented by uh, individuals who are of national prominence in relation to hearing, hearing loss and hearing aids. Uh, a cochlear implant group that meets quarterly for people with cochlear implants or those who are thinking about it. A monthly newsletter, and here's a little sales pitch, although I'm sure it doesn't apply to you, Isabella. Um, your membership is only $10. And if somebody wants to join, they can contact us at the, uh, the address that's underlined there. So about these sessions, <clears throat> excuse me. Each session is scheduled for one and a half hours. There is information presented about important things to know about hearing and hearing loss. And we provide a question and answer session at the end of the tutorial part. These sessions are recorded. You can see them on YouTube, up to but not including the questions and answers, which are not recorded for reasons of confidentiality. You can access the sessions through the HLAA Rochester Chapter website. So this is the thrust of our meetings. Uh, it's my sense that there's probably nothing harder to buy than a hearing aid. They have very high cost. Few people have really any concept of brand recognition for hearing aids. Um, who knows what's a good one and what's not a good one. We all know about the popular commercial ones, Beltone and Miracle Ear and what have you. 
but we don't know how they stack up compared to the other devices that are out there. And then of course, folks always have concerns about whether or not the hearing aids are gonna work for them. That's understandable because we hear so much about hearing aids don't work or they don't work well. And there's such high cost involved. So that very often it's very hard for people to come to the, the action point where they are going to move forward with hearing aids. And that's very understandable. Because of this and all the other factors involved, our purpose here is to provide assistance through the very difficult early stages of getting hearing aids. So here is the outline of what we're going to be talking about. We're, the three sessions, as I said, will consist of a learning portion followed by questions and answers. The first session is just generally important things to know about getting hearing aids. The second session is about hearing loss and hearing and hearing aids and a bit on understanding the audiogram because everyone needs to know what their hearing is like and how to interpret their own audiograms. The third session of reasonable expectations based on the experiences of a large number of people in our practice here in Webster while I was practicing. Now about me, I'm a retired audiologist. I am an ABD, that means all but dissertation. I was a PhD student, but never completed the degree. Um, I'm a former director of audiology at a very large community hearing and speech center for about 20 years. I've been a hearing aid user for 20 years. And I've also seen the field of audiology for 24 years in private practice as an audiologist. Throughout my career, beginning with the early days at the hearing and speech agency, I've been very interested in issues of hearing aid candidacy and then hearing aid fitting outcomes because we wanted to make sure that what we were doing for our users was optimized and they were doing as well as they possibly could. Along this line, I listened to or used every hearing aid we provided. And I probably had 60 to 70 hearing aids in our software of those hearing aids that I had listened and tried before we dispensed them. I have over 20 research and tutorial presentations at various state and national meetings, a patent and a couple of articles pertaining to hearing aids. Um, here's my approach to hearing aids. I operated under several assumptions, which included Hearing aids are very expensive, as we've already said. And I really wanted to bring down the cost. Unlike most people, I thought hearing aids were way overpriced. I mean, like most people. But I found out, actually, they're not. It was not easy to do. Uh, people are fearful about getting hearing aids, we've already talked about. And there's the expectation of, of, of problems and difficulties. Also, I believe that users don't know what's normal or what's not normal and what they shouldn't have to put up with. And I think sometimes they have a hard time accepting that they're not going to sound like those things you hear with other headset or ear level, ear level devices. So my approach to hearing aids was, was based on the above. And if they're having problems with their hearing aids, they don't know if it's because it's something they're doing or if it's their hearing loss or if it's the hearing aid, if it's the way it's fit, all these questions. And they don't tend to follow up sometimes. They wonder if they're being too critical. It costs them more. And if they wonder too, are they being unreasonable because they don't know what to expect. And then there's the human nature aspect of it too. Just let it go. They don't work anyways, that's the way it is. So 
So I just want to go on to say now, all of these things that I'm, I'm going to be talking about pertained only to my practice and the way I chose to implement it. Now, obviously, it's based on what I had learned and what I'd read and uh, what I thought was the best way to proceed with these issues. And we all know that if you talk to 10 or 15 people about any topic for advice, you are likely to receive 10 to 15 different approaches to the same topic. This is true for hearing aids and hearing aid fitting protocols also. It's unlikely therefore that you will find anyone who agrees with everything or even many things that we talk about here today. But these are the basic things. For us, the proof was in the outcomes, not the procedures or the device. These devices have all these wonderful and marvelous claims that I was never ever able to evaluate. So I didn't know what how effective voice finder was or uh, comfort hearing. I couldn't measure that. All I could measure was the outcome. So that's what I focused on. We kept over 140 data points for each user, frequently tallying them, using results to adjust our procedures, and then occasionally report our findings at various professional venues. This was the only way we were able to evaluate how we were doing and how to evaluate the various claims of technology or advances reported by the different manufacturers. Everybody came in with great technology and a great routine and a great song and dance, but I had no idea how effective these claims really were. So finally, if you have a current provider and they are working with you in some way, keep in mind that nobody knows your hearing better and your needs and your provider, regardless of what we say here. As I've said, we opted for an active follow-up. Now this meant it was our assumption that it was our responsibility to assure the user was doing well and without problems that could be avoided. To, to this end, we followed up after almost every visit when the patient came in with either a phone call or a follow-up visit that was scheduled in the near future. So let's talk a little bit about what it means to have a hearing loss. It's basically a diminution of effective listening distance. And the perspective is that normal hearing should equate with the ability to hear a soft voice at a distance of 20 feet in quiet. That's really what normal hearing means. A mild hearing loss reduces that effective listening distance to about 10 feet, possibly maybe 15. And a moderate hearing loss, even more, it's necessary to get even closer maybe five to 10 feet. And a severe hearing loss is, it reduces your listening distance to three to five feet. Now this is without a hearing aid. And profound, three to, three to one, one foot or right up next to the ear and actually shouting. And of course, deaf means no usable hearing for purposes of communication by speech. We'll talk more about this later on. But here, first, let's look at an audiogram. Here is a typical audiogram. I'm gonna get my, my laser pointer over here if I can find it. And there it is. And we'll call it up. And so the normal range of hearing is from minus 10 all the way down to 120 decibels. Actually, it goes up to 130 in terms of the, uh, the level of discomfort or pain. So that's a 140 decibel range. That's huge. It's so big that it's expressed in a log scale rather than the typical linear scale as you'll see on your rulers. Let's just give you an idea of what's involved. Zero dB 
is the softest sound that people can hear ordinarily. And that's like leaves rustling in the breeze, this kind of thing. Uh, a, a drip of water maybe, um, all the way up to dogs barking, uh, the telephone ring, bus, and jets are upwards of 120 to 30 to 40. They can be very loud. I'll just call your attention now to these speech sounds. Notice this big heavy line at a thousand hertz. Almost all of, in fact, all of the voiced consonants like Z, V, J, M, and so on are below a thousand hertz. Also notice they're very loud compared to these others over here. These are the ones that contain the critical information of speech. So unfortunately, where most hearing loss occurs, it usually it's better in the lows, drops down in the highs. So these are more like the alerting sounds in our environment. And these are the informational sounds in our environment. These things are just physically louder. These sounds here are physically softer, yet they're very critical for understanding speech, particularly F, S, and T, H, and K. Now with my hearing loss, I just do not hear the F, S, and the TH. And you'll see why as we, as we get along further in this discussion. So you can see there's a big difference between the softest consonants and the loudest vowels. And it's this big difference that confuses so many people because they hear the voice sounds normally and they're thinking, I don't have a problem. The issue is that people are mumbling. They're not speaking as clearly as they used to. Well, in fact, they haven't changed the way they speak. Instead, we have, we have changed the way that we hear. So this is great. This gives you a very good idea of the range of hearing. But of course, when you get a hearing aid, what happens is you take that range of hearing and you compress it into a much narrower, narrower range of hearing. And this is illustrated quite nicely in the next slide. So here's what's happened. The hearing aids don't expand your hearing. We wish they did, but they compress what's in your environment into a very narrow range of hearing. And while they do this, you can see that all the differences between these sounds are not as great as they were before. Now, some research has said that doesn't make a difference. People make the same number of discriminations between all the sounds. Some research has said to the contrary. Obviously though, it's going to be more difficult to experience in quotes, normal like hearing as hearing goes down. It's always gonna sound not like normal hearing. Here's my audiogram as we said. Now you can see I have very good hearing in the lows, particularly at 1000, but it drops down considerably in the highs. This is a very typical pattern. And I know that at least two or three of the fellows who are with us today have hearing kind of similar to this. It might be a little worse in the highs. It might not. The circles represent the right ear, X's, represent the left ear. And these triangles, this is normative. And this is obtained from a study in the Netherlands in a part of a city there. And they just measured hearing for a large number of people. And then they, 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 and then they reported it as a function of age. I selected the group from 80 to 87 years of age, because that's where I fall. And you can see that largely parallels the normative data. Um, and this was when the study was done, was in 2018. So the triangles are normative data, the circles are right ear, X's are left. Your audio play of X's in zeros or circles. 
And then let's look at these values up here. This is important to keep this in mind. And you'll see this in, in future audiograms that we show. 8%, that means the percentage of, in, of intelligibility that the band of frequencies centered around 250 cycles or hertz uh, contributes to understanding speech. Here, 14%. So you see that in the lows, which are well preserved, they don't really contribute much to understanding. They contribute a lot to hearing sounds around you, but not to understanding. All of the understanding starts at 1K, 1, 1,000, runs out to 4,000. And you can see that the 1,000 is worth 22% towards understanding. Critical, 2,000 is worth 33%, and 4,000 is worth um, uh, 23%. So more than half of critical hearing for understanding speech occurs in the range of 2,000 to 4,000 hertz. Out here in the higher frequency, there's really not much effect in terms of understanding speech. So this will give you an idea of the relative importance of the different frequencies for understanding speech in quiet, once again. So in reviewing the audiogram here, there's only th three things you need to know about your own hearing. And I recommend that you try to really get a handle on these. First, you have to know how severe it is, right? And you can tell that by the pure tone average. Now I'll go back to this previous slide. And the pure tone average consists of the value for 500, 1,000, 2,000, and 4,000. They're added up, divided by four, and that gives you the average range of, of, uh, of, of hearing. Of course, the higher the number, the greater the severity of the hearing loss. And then the configuration, the pattern of the hearing loss. And we'll see more about that um, in um, uh, part two. And that's very important because if your hearing loss goes flat across, then you have a very high potential for doing well with hearing aids. However, if it drops really sharply, that's going to be a tough nut to crack. And it's not the fault ever of the hearing aid. It's the fault of the hearing loss. And that's very, very hard, <clears throat> unfortunately, to overcome. And we'll learn more about that in part two. And then the important score, I call it WRS, Word Recognition Score. This is a value or a report of how well the individual hears uh, very familiar words spoken at a very high level in quiet, delivered one word at a time with ample chance or opportunity between them to perceive what it was and report back. This is a measure of distortion in the inner ear. And that's one of the primary determinants of how well people do with hearing aids. If someone has reduced word recognition scores, then they're not gonna be as satisfied, unfortunately, with their hearing aids. Uh, these three items can give you a very good idea of your prognosis with amplification and how severe your hearing loss is. As we said already, some configurations make it more difficult to use amplification. Sharply falling configurations or sawtooth, oh, they're tough because how do you amplify the, the part that's down and ignore the part that's up and because you don't want to make it too loud for that individual at those frequencies. They can be very, very difficult hearing losses to ameliorate. Ordinarily, given time, they'll tend to smooth out. But when they first start, it's been my impression. I don't know this. I haven't read this. It's my impression that um, um, uh, they can be more jagged in the beginning. And of course, very severe 
is hard because you don't have very much residual hearing left with which to work. And of course, word recognition score. If that's reduced, it's going to be difficult uh, for some hearing losses to be fully satisfied with amplification. Once again, the pure tone average indicates the degree of hearing loss, as we've said, it's the average of the four critical frequencies for speech understanding, and it's an overall indicator of the level of hearing. I say this because, and I repeat it, because it's so very important. And the same is true for word recognition ability. Um, on rare occasions, the score might be uh, a little misleading if it's low, if it's not presented at a high level. It has to be presented at a higher level to make sure that all the parts of the words are audible for the individual who's just had the hearing test. And we'll talk more later on about hair cells. And I think you'll get a very good understanding of the limitations involved. Let's talk about hearing aids, because we know they're very expensive. And every hearing aid user, new hearing aid user, wonders why in the world are they as expensive as they are? First of all, they're not a simple listening device like headsets or earbuds. They are miniature public address systems that use a microphone or an and an amplifier and a speaker. So they have all these major components of a public address system. And they serve a wide variety of functions, unlike a public address system that only has one purpose for a particular audience at a particular point in time. These things are working all the time. And they're in real time in a real environment. And their acoustic environment is constantly changing that they have to adapt to. So it's they're never going to sound like your headset or your other ear level devices. They are useful on telephone. And they're good with assistive listening devices at worship or auditoriums and performances. They're just so much more versatile than a uh, typical headborne device. As we said, they function in a wide variety of situations. Up close, at various distances, maybe up to 20 feet, 25 feet, with just one person at a time, or several people, or at a crowded function, in quiet, in noise, at sporting events, at performances, and there's no filtering of the sounds that are coming to it. They're gathering everything near and far, loud and soft. That's not like anything else that you listen to over an ear level device. And they do not have the advantage of microphone placement. They have the microphone is right up here by your ear. It's not by the person speaking. That's a huge difference. So of course that microphone is gonna pick up the loudest sounds in the environment and everything that's between the microphone and the listener or the source of the sound and the listener. And we can't stress enough that they have a very limited power supply. They're operating on a volt and a half as against 110 or 220 or even greater for some other situations. That really limits what the capability of a hearing aid, not to mention the small little diameter of the microphone and the, the speaker or the receiver. And as we've already said, they pick up sounds right next to you or maybe 15, 20 feet away. They rarely operate in quiet. There's always some kind of noise. And they work at home at the store, at weddings, they're tough. Weddings are tough. Restaurants are tough. Worship, infinitely wide variety of acoustic environments. So they do a lot more than folks may not realize. And they're very different, as we've said, from the Walkman, iPod, headsets, TV, etc. These devices are all passive amplifiers. They never have to process the raw signal. 
Everything they pass on is already pre-recorded and pre-processed in a sound studio. Microphones are very close to the source, right at the mouth or on the lapel. And every single thing that's said or happens goes through audio engineers at these big sound boards, right? where they have multiple input channels, one for each source of sound, each one which has a wide variety of adjustments and controls and channels. And each input can be modified so as to make it all the same and for optimum hearing levels and sounds and pitches. And they, all of these things happen in ordinarily in a perfectly controlled acoustic environment. And there's no background noise. It's not allowed. Now, the exception, of course, is sporting events. And where's the microphone? It's right here, so close to the mic that the engineer doesn't have to turn up the gain very loud on the e equipment. So he's not picking up all the sounds in the environment. If, if someone holds the mic down here, then I guarantee you, you're going to get a lot of crowd noise and other interference. So let's talk a little bit about some of the features or characteristics of hearing aids. Of course, they make sounds louder, like earbuds or smartphones. You know, that's easy to do. That's inexpensive. We were able to do that in one of our classes in grad school. We built little amplifying circuits, and they worked fine. Um, that's That's not hard. But... The, the difficulty comes in controlling the loudness of those sounds because we can't exceed the user's dynamic range of hearing. That means the softest sounds they can hear to the loudest they can tolerate. We have to pack it within that very narrow range. And that's where the com complexity begins. Uh, we have to further expand the soft sounds so that we bring them up to audibility quickly. But then, we've, then we can't keep making them louder because if we do, it'll get too loud and we'll, we'll exceed the threshold of discomfort. So they go up quickly, then they get knocked over a little bit. And then they get knocked over and knocked over and knocked over. And that happens generally about nine times for any particular channel. And then keep in mind that hearing aids nowadays probably have 20 channels. And so you've got 20 channels where you're having expansion and then various levels of compression. Each one of those little points that where it bends over is called a knee point. It's the knee that bends. And very often the provider has the opportunity to adjust these, these various uh, 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 compression ranges. So that's how complicated these things are. In, in addition to the compression stuff, they have a noise reduction feature. And almost all hearing aids now contain directional microphones. And that includes a reversal of the phase of the sounds in front with the back. So they kind of cancel out. You don't need to understand it. Just know that there are uh, directional microphones. And these things work great. They're, they're picking up sounds all around your head and they're focusing what they it thinks you need to hear and it amplifies that and reduces everything else. And they're doing this all within the user's range of hearing from the softest sound to the loudest sound. And unlike anything that's recorded, or over your headsets. They're doing this in real time. So your hearing aids are taking the place of a sound studio. And therein lies one of the reasons for the great expense in hearing aids. It's a lot more complicated to do it than people initially realize. Um, we've already talked about that they can tell where the hearing, where the signal's coming from. They can identify oftentimes the signal from the noise. Of course, it gets hard when they're trying to identify the voice you want to hear because they're designed to amplify human voices, of course. So that's a lot more difficult. 
Um, and they have multi programs now. And sometimes they switch automatically from one program to another. Sometimes a user selects or overrides the automatic programs. They have programs for speech and quiet. They have programs for speech and noise and various kinds of noise. They have programs for music. They have programs for television or for uh, uh, worship. There's any number of programs now. You don't need, I think, a whole lot of programs. Most users only settle for one or two, rarely three. And one of the reasons, of course, is that lots of times you have to toggle through them all, and that gets very inconvenient. Your hearing aids can hook up to your TVs, your smartphones, remote microphones, etc., computers using your Bluetooth. There's so much more complicated than your earphones or your iPods or any other listening devices you might come across. They're doing so much. We've already talked about some of the things they do. Expansion and then compression. And they're doing this in multi-channels and they're doing noise management, noise reduction. They even talk to each other so they can optimize the signal for what you're trying to hear on this side and help to optimize what's coming in on this side. They have open ear acoustics. Now, if you don't know what that means, it means that the ear now can be left unplugged for many hearing losses. <clears throat> which leads to a more common or comfortable sound. And they have feedback suppression, which means they don't ring and whistle like they used to. They still have a tendency to do that, but it's not nearly like it used to be. And when they do ring and whistle, it's normally for a very short duration and the feedback cancellation technology comes into play and takes care of it for us. Now, I just give you something I read just recently from one of the companies on their page for providers like, like audiologists and other dispensers. They're reviewing some of the features of their latest product. They have a self-contained power supply, which of course we all take for granted, but yet the manufacturers know this is a really big deal to pack a whole lot of stuff. And a little tiny battery that's about that big around and maybe that thick. That's, that's amazing what they get out of the power that's available. They take digital processing. So they're listening to stuff outside there in the environment. And they analyze it 56,000 times per second. I can't evaluate that. I can't tell you the difference functionally between 56,000 times a second versus 20,000 times a second versus 11,000 times a second. All I can do is to know the outcome. How are you doing? How do you judge your performance? And not only do they do this 56,000 times per second, and I assume in each of the various channels, they're, they're processing your environment and they're trying to pick a hundred times a second what it is that's critical that you want to listen to. So 56,000 times a second separates good stuff from bad stuff and a hundred times a, a second separates important from unimportant. How do they do that? I don't know, but they do. And they're constantly rebalancing the auditory input of the individual sounds with extremely fast noise reduction, which removes the noise between the words. That's unbelievable it can work that fast. Now, this may or may not be an advantage for older ears such as mine, because your neurological processing time slows down considerably. And so maybe for older ears, it might be better to not have so much processing available. Who knows? that could vary by individual. So let's talk now a little bit about getting hearing aids. We've already said, probably nothing harder to buy, coupled with a high cost and with the idea that hearing aids don't work. There's no brand recognition. 
and there's so many places to go online, mail order. You go to a, a, a discount big box store. They have lower prices, no doubt about it. Do you go to a franchise, Miracle here, Belltone, here USA, or whatever? Do you go to a commercial dispenser in your town and stands alone all by himself? There aren't very many left anymore. Or do you go see an audiologist? There's all these options. Um, I will say something about franchises here before we move on. Franchises can only sell that brand of hearing aid. Now, they always can get another brand, but it's at a premium cost for you, the, the user, you pay extra. So that means that, that the Miracle Ear a company can only use hearing aids that the Miracle Ear company buys. And Belltone can only use Belltone hearing aids and so on. Now, that's good for a lot of instances, but everybody knows that every company, every manufacturer kicks out a bad one every now and then, or one that just isn't suitable for a certain kind of hearing loss. And you want to go out and you want to get a better one. Well, there's a whole lot of professional scuttlebutt between the various providers. So everybody knows what's the good hearing aids and what's the bad ones in terms of brands and who's got a bad model, who has got one that's good for this or, or good for that. But if, if you're in a franchise, you have to buy within that franchise 90 to 95% of the time. So there's a good chance at times there's going to be some compromises made. And then also don't forget that, uh, um, I lost my train of thought, that they're going to be hard to buy. And if you're having a problem with your hearing aid, all their stuff is proprietary, all their software. So no one else can work on it. You have to go back to that that franchise for service. So that can be a real disadvantage. And I think that's true too for some of the big box stores because they have a franchise brand effectively. And there's only three or four models or companies they can work with. And you can't go anyplace else except back to that company. Audiologists on the other hand, they have a wide, now they have access to everything that's not franchise. And so they generally have a much better range of devices they can work from. I will say, however, that it's very hard now with all of the, the modern technology and all the different parts, you really can't work with much more than one or two brands. Know them well and have all the supplies and stock that you need. It, it is such a complicated issue. I pretty much focus with one brand, and then I would have one or two others that I would use for special circumstances, as I said, based on the scuttlebutt that we got at our meetings and this kind of thing. Um, so here's some items that, that you hear. And one, of the, and one of the things you read in AARP magazine and other advice places is negotiate the best price. No, you don't. Not if you're dealing with a professional practice and probably not with a franchise. They're not negotiable. The franchises don't have a choice. Professional practices, you've got to look at it like you don't negotiate with your dentist. You don't negotiate with your optometrist. You can select different models. But once you've done that, that's the price. And it's the same kind of thing. Not only that, our approach was that hearing aids are something that people have to have. And it didn't seem fair to me that those people with fewer negotiating skills would get a better deal than those who had good negotiating skills and probably had a lot more money. So no, everything was flat. The price was the price. On the other hand, if somebody came in and said they need help, that's a whole different story. They claimed that they were in financial straits. So the important thing to keep in mind here is that, and this is the crux of this section today, 
that when somebody gets a hearing aids, aid, they are not buying a device or the latest technology. That's what everybody thinks they're getting, but that's not it. Instead, they're entering into a long-term relationship with their provider, possibly for the rest of their life, 15, 20, 25 years or more. And the disadvantages we've already said of the, uh, of the big box stores or the franchises is the software is proprietary. And it makes it harder to travel. Boy, if you're hearing it breaks down while well, you're in, in Kansas City and you're per, and you don't have one of those franchises there, what are you going to do? And they're generally staffed by sales-oriented people with the limited choices we've said of brands or models of brands. And very often their staff is fairly transient. So if you get attached to somebody there's no guarantee they're going to be there for a long time because that may not be a career opportunity for some folks. And this just restates that the provider is far more important than the than the device. Um, it's really knowing what to do with it and making sure of a good outcome. That's operative word outcome rather than a than a sale. Okay. Um, some rules of thumb, never, ever follow up on a splashy ad. You know what good ads mean? They mean good advertising agencies rather than good providers. And every franchise or large, large corporation, they can all afford great ads, but there's a real scatter in the provider skills and abilities. And never go to an ad that says they have a national expert who's there for two or three days. That expert is expert at one thing, selling you hearing aids. And he's going to sell you as good a one or as expensive, or she is, as expensive as you can imagine or afford. Then you'll never see that person again, regardless of how charming they are and what good things they say about their product. And then keep in mind, there's no big hearing aid breakthroughs. It just doesn't happen. They're, they're always improving, but it's incremental. It's a little bit at a time. And as we said before, it's not the technology. It's the ability of the provider to manage it and get the most out of it that counts. That's the important thing. Um, and I would just say one other thing, and I, I should include that in these slides. Don't ever go for 50% off or 30% off. There is no such thing. What they're talking about is the manufacturer's suggested retail price, which for some companies is pegged at two times the average retail price. So you think you're you're getting 50% off on your franchise brand. Guess what? You're not. You're paying the normal price. So never, never follow up on what are some of the things we've said here on a splashy ad. Never be taken in by 50% off or 30% off. I guarantee you it just doesn't happen. Wholesale price is 50% of the product. So you're not gonna get a hearing aid for 50% off. Realistically, it can't be done. So if you're going to get a hearing aid, you know what? Try to avoid tiny. Don't try to hide your hearing aid. If you do that, you're gonna lose features and options. And they're so small nowadays, who cares anyways? You know, I've got one on, see? They're, they're tiny. They're invisible. Um, I just got out of the shower. I guess I left the other one upstairs. Uh, normally I wear two, but it, 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 at home, it's all very functional with one, to be honest with you. Um, think of behind the ear like I just showed you. Um, and you want easy to use controls. Now, I, I can add that nowadays that's not as important as it might have been because so many hearing aids now are programmable by your smartphone. 
And if you have a smartphone, then you can adjust the volume, select the program, do all kinds of really neat things with them. If you're a techie type of person, as these guys that are, are with us today are, oh, they can do magic with it. But most of us just kind of set the programs we need and just let it stay that way. Um, if you have trouble manipulating small things and your fingers are numb, such as mine are, it's very hard to get used to these very, very thin wires and hold them and manage them. And this little tiny receiver, that's actually an electronic device that goes in your ear. And so you may need a, a, a bigger type earpiece or, or the type of hearing aid that's all in the ear. They're a better solution, but ordinarily, um, uh, you, you do want to avoid tiny. The smaller they are, the, uh, the less features you have. Always try to make sure you get a volume control. Now, if your volume control is activated and it's in your, uh, you can manage it through your smartphone, why that's good. If you always have your phone, of course. Or a T-coil. Usually with beginners, they're not as critical, but it's good to think in terms of them. They cost, both of these features cost very little extra, and they give you so many more degrees of freedom that it's a shame to not get those with your hearing aid, especially your first set. And we cannot say the importance enough of having a volume control. Although you have all these wonderful programs and all these good things that happen, through your hearing aids. There's times you're going to want to turn down your hearing aid and turn them up. And you want multiple programs and that's almost automatic with every hearing aid you get now. They're easy to come by. They're not as expensive to add on as they used to be. So they're, they're pretty standard. I found in my practice, and this is a big point here, that mid-grade hearing aids work best for most hearing losses. And the low end, every once in a while would try them. They didn't work out well for people. They did okay in the short term, meaning the first four months, six months. But in our long-term follow-up studies, which we do after, after individuals had had their hearing aids for at least one year and no longer than three, when they came in for their follow-up or their, or their long-term outcome, they weren't happy with their hearing aids. They didn't like them it, because they just didn't answer their questions for everyday listening. So uh, mid-grade works best. If somebody has a very complicated hearing loss, why then uh, we would recommend the high end or if they have demanding listening situations, we would recommend a high M and or they'd want them. And they would generally do better in those instances. But most of my users, mid-grade really served them quite well. And avoid lower grade companies. Now, of course, the consumer can't know what the lower grade companies are, can they? I mean, it, it, I mean who knows? You don't have brand recognition. So you just have to take the word on your provider, ask around, find out who's a good provider. And then you want two hearing aids. Here's a great slide. This is, illustrates the advantages of binaural hearing aids or two hearing aids. And the term is binaural rather than bilateral, okay? So you can see that the heavy dots represent somebody with normal hearing. And then you can see over on the far left-hand side, the various situations. In quiet, there's not much difference between one or two hearing aids, is there? Yeah, and the lower scale is um, uh, a percentage of intelligibility. Now, this lack of difference breaks down as you get into more and more noise-based environments. And there, there's a huge difference between one and two hearing aids. And that's really the case. Uh, they make a big difference in terms of understanding ability. 
And you can see it almost approaches the normal range. Uh, I'm not quite that optimistic, but still, that's very nice. Uh, 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 this is a, a very definitive difference. And you can count on that actually being the case. So now when you get your hearing aids, you wanna make sure you see the most qualified provider. You wanna know your hearing loss, your configuration, your word recognition score. Make sure you get a copy of the audiogram before you leave the office. It's the law. And make sure you have a word recognition test completed. You do not want to buy a hearing aid if you don't know what your ability to do well with it is. You've got to have your word recognition score. Uh, just an information thing, veterans might be eligible for services through the Veterans Administration. So in summary, today we covered the general information about hearing loss and a very brief review of the audiogram. We'll talk more about it at the next session. A little bit more, a little bit about hearing aids and some introductions into things you need to know about getting hearing aids. There's a lot to this business, a lot more complicated than people think I am. So on Monday, we'll cover some critical aspects you need to know about getting your hearing aids. And we'll give you some good information about the various types of providers that are out there. So that's it for today. And now we can take questions and answers. Joe, would you like me to stop recording? Sure. Yeah, go ahead, Chaz. Yeah. Okay.